from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the African and Middle East Division of the Library of Congress. Today's lecture on the discovery of Karaman Lidiki, Disappearing Literature, Artifacts, and Cultural Heritage by Selene Idaj and Constantina Constantino is sponsored by the Near East Section of the African and Middle East Division. I'm Joan Weeks, head of the Near East Section. On behalf of all my colleagues, and in particular, Dr. Mary Jane Deep, who unfortunately can't be with us today, she's chief of the division, I'd like to welcome you to uh, our very special program today. But before we get started, I always like to give a brief overview of the division and in the hopes that she'll come back to use our collections for your research. This division is comprised of three sections that build and serve uh, our collections to researchers from around the world. We cover 78 countries and more than 35 languages. The Africa section includes all the countries of Sub-Sahara Africa. The Hebraic section is responsible for Judaica and Hebraica worldwide. And the Near East section covers all of the Arab countries, including North Africa, Turkey, Iran, Afghanistan, Central Asia, the Muslims in Western China, Russia, the Balkans, and the peoples of the Caucasus. So you see we encompass a very wide region. After the program, we'd invite you to fill in the evaluation forms that you, fill, you see on your chairs, if you could kindly do that. Uh, we like to see how uh, we're doing with our programs. And also, uh, we have a little brochure about our Four Corners blog posts. Uh, we like to promote those uh, to enhance the ability for researchers around the world to know what we have here in our collections. And also, I'd just quickly remind you that our pre program today is being videotaped, so if you ask questions, just uh, implicitly, you're giving your permission. Um, so please don't hesitate, but uh, just to be aware that that is uh, being recorded. So now I'd like to introduce our speakers. Dr. Selene um, Aitosh is Associate Professor at Long Island University and a Fulbright Scholar. She just finished uh, her Fulbright Scholarship, so that's quite an accomplishment. Uh, she conducted her doctoral research in the field of bibliometrics. Um, that's a very uh, esoteric field, to say the least. Uh, and she studied scholarly communication and the behavior of Turkish scientists. She's also interested in user studies, particularly serving diverse student groups such as international students in academic libraries. And Dr. Constantina Constantino is Dean of University Libraries at Stony Brook University in New York and also a Fulbright Scholar. And uh, she's published and presented her research on topics ranging from organizational performance, information literacy, information systems, library technology, digital preservation, scholarly communication. So you can see she's had a wide range of uh, interests. And uh, she's an established public speaker. She's been invited to present her research at library conferences in the United States and worldwide, including China, Cyprus, Finland, France, Greece, Turkey, Korea, Russia, Ukraine, Croatia, Hong Kong, Spain, it goes on. So Constantine is also co-editor of the book International Librarianship, Developing Professional, Interculture, and Educational Leadership. Please help me welcome Drs. Aitak and Constantino to the podium. Good afternoon, everyone. What a pleasure to be here. Thank you for your hospitality and for the great honor to invite us to the Library of Congress, the Division of Africa and Eastern, and, and, and Eastern Middle Eastern Division to present, to present our research. My name is Costandia, and I'm delighted to be here with my colleague, 
Sally and I, that we met accidentally when I was finishing my Fulbright coming from Cyprus and she was getting ready to go to Turkey to start her Fulbright on the same research topic that we both had fallen in love with. Our research topic is on the discovery of Karaman Lidiga. To paraphrase a scholar by the name of uh, Matthias Kabler from his book, Tale of Two Languages Tracing the History of Turkish and Greek Language, no society is purely monolingual and no human expression of art or communication is monocultural. And this is what Selena and I came to discover in our respective countries and cultures. The outline of our presentation will talk about the origins of Karamanlidiga, Karamanlidiga terminology, our Fulbright projects, and what brought us into this kind of research, the people of Cyprus as have been divided and reunited in their own cultures, the Karamanlidiga digital library that um, Selenai's project is um, addressing, and some recommendations that we came from our research. The origins of Karamanlidiga and Karamanlides and the Karamanli people is starting from 1071 when Turks began to settle in Anatolia and the indigenous population of Anatolia spoke and wrote Greek and they were Greek Orthodox. But nevertheless, Turks did not call them Greek, but they follow the Arab tradition of calling them Rum, which meant Romans. And among this community, there was a group of Turkish who wrote in Greek alphabet. They lived in places in Anatolia, such as Karaman region, Konya, Mersin, Selivke, Kayseri, Yokad, Ankara, and later, because of trade and economy, some of them settled in the cities such as uh, Trabzon, Izmir, and Istanbul. This shaded map shows, shows the area of Karaman in relation to Turkey, Greece, Cyprus, and Middle East. And the next map gives us a better, it's a historical map, a better understanding where the region is by name and shading of colors. The Karaman region is the Greek region right in the middle of Anatolia above Cyprus. Now there are two theories about the Karaman leaders. Karaman leaders were descended from religiously converted Turkish soldiers, the Turkobols, that Byzantine emperors settled in Anatolia. And another theory that seems to be a little bit more convincing is that the Karaman leaders are the direct descendants of Byzantine Greeks. Despite their linguistic Turkification, they maintain their Greek Orthodox faith. And we find some of those elements from 19th century linguists who travel throughout the Karamanli speaking regions of Cappadocia and documented few of the remaining Greek words that were most, mostly the elderly people spoke. Karamanlides did not adopt the Greek national, national identity of the time, but they prefer instead to be called Rome, the Romans Christians of Christian Anatolia. Karamanlides is um, one of the many interesting uh, communities in need of the creation of a niche personal community knowledge environment as an archetype for uh, similar conceptualization. If we summarize what uh, Constantia just uh, uh, briefly mentioned, Karamanlides, also known as Karamanli people, are those who spoke Ottoman Turkish and wrote in Greek characters in Asia Minor during the rule of the Ottoman Empire. 
Karamanlı Turkish community has been forced to leave the country in accord with the 1923 Mubadele, Lausanne. So uh, there is no more Karamanlı community left in Turkey anymore. And the cultural artifacts, all the Karamanlı artifacts scattered over the World Wide Web are the only evidence of their existence. If we just uh, look into the language discourse again, uh, Karamanlı Turkish is spoken Ottoman Turkish and written Greek. If we just go into Ottoman Turkish case, we see Ottoman Turkish and Arabic alphabets. And for Greek is Greek spoken and, and Greek written. So for the case of Karamanlı Turkish, we see the combination of a little bit um, change Greek alphabets, manipulated just to give some of the sounds that Ottoman Turkish has, and uh, spoken uh, purely Ottoman Turkish. And if we refer the same uh, scientist again, the same scholar, Matthias Kapler, he pointed out that no individual is perfectly monolingual, no society is purely monocultural, and no human expression of arts or any type of communication is free from any external influence. So uh, works that were published in Ottoman Turkish using Greek script are called Karamanlidika or Karamanli Turkish is the great example of what scholar Kapler uh, mentioned, discussed in, in his works. And uh, works that published in Ottoman Turkish using Greek scripts are the great uh, example of this cross-cultural uh, uh, concern and uh, it is uh, exchanging between two cultures. And um, if I uh, go back to my digital library projects, we see that the, the aim of the project was the discovery of Karamanlides artifacts but not just discovery of these artifacts, but also the reconnecting of people to their cultural heritage and their lost memories via a digital platform, a digital library. And uh, it was not just a digital library project uh, to start with. Uh, one of the aims, objectives of this project was to facilitate in the long term, of course, a genealogy research among these dispersed people and common understanding of cultural heritage, common cities, and shared countries such as Cyprus, country that remains divided between Greek and Turkish Cypriots. Um, my methodology, the first step was to identify available digital uh, Karamanlides cultural artifacts via social media tools. So I use Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube, and I use some keywords to uh, uh, find, retrieve some Karamanlides, and pinpoint the useful metadata for such a project. And the next step focused on the analysis of these uh, user-created, uh, generated metadata. And uh, based on the findings of this study, we found many Karaman Lidika artifacts get scattered all over the World Wide Web. And um, most of them lack, uh, lacking descriptive metadata. Now I have a, 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 I have a schema here. You can see uh, some of the artifacts listed. Two uh, artifacts retrieved via Twitter, and three of them from Facebook, and uh, two from YouTube. The first one is um, a book title page of a book, a monograph, found in Twitter by using the uh, keyword uh, Karamanlidika. And the date is clearly uh, visible. Uh, the date was 1784. And of course, uh, not so much information on this Twitter uh, uh, tweets. Uh, there is no information about location and uh, there is no translation, but in some cases you see that there is a transliteration of Karaman Lidika here. And the second uh, artifact uh, I gathered via Twitter was uh, 
an inscripted stone enter of the building. And of course, we didn't have the date or any information about this. The, uh, it was just uh, a, a picture of an inscripted stone with uh, Karaman Lidika on it. And um, some other data gathered from Facebook discussion groups. Facebook is a great platform that uh, many people, they get together and they join to these uh, groups and they discuss uh, the different images and uh, different surrogates. They, they talk about the language, they transliterate, and they discuss uh, about the uh, uh, resources they upload on these Facebook groups. The, this one was also from um, uh, Cyprus, Guzaliurt the person who took the picture of this inscripted uh, stone enter of the house put the place that it's, it's taken at Cyprus. And the date, uh, we guess it's from 1900s. And, um, and, and, and this uh, individual used the tags Karamanice and Karamanlılar. These are two popular tags used among uh, Turkish uh, researchers, uh, uh, Turkish historians. They use this Turkish tags. And uh, the next one was a photograph, again, found through these Facebook discussion groups. And they used the tags Karaman Lidika and Karaman Lide, so it was easier to, uh, to retrieve this one with the common keywords we use. And uh, it was the picture of an orphanage from Cappadocia. It's uh, Zinjirdere, the current uh, region. And uh, it was uh, suspected that the date is uh, 1911 or 12. And um, we found another picture from Kayseri that we see a family picture, five, six, five people all together. And uh, it's also dated 1924. And a relative uh, posted this picture. They are, it's their family photographs. And uh, they post their picture and they point that it's their uh, family members. And they look forward to if anybody else knows the other relatives or neighbors. Uh, information about them. And um, also, uh, we use YouTube to find some other artifacts, and uh, we found one oral interview and one song. And um, oral interview uh, conducted in 2013, and uh, she remembers how her um, relatives came from Turkey and how they spoke and uh, how they sang and uh, all the information about the the, uh, the homeland and, and the village they live. So she had all this information in this oral interview. And she also had some of the artifacts uh, remain from uh, her grandmother that they brought together, some of the cooking utensils, some other kitchen stuff. So these are uh, two great uh, uh, pieces that uh, we gather from, from YouTube. And um, uh, if we go back to the digital library prototype we presented, we see a four-layer system. And the first one, we see the content, metadata. And uh, the second one is system and network, users, and uh, management and policy. In the content metadata area, we propose that uh, with this digital library, users can upload all the artifacts they house in their family archives or uh, any, um, any other photographs they taken in these uh, unique villages. And they can just upload those. And they can also annotate the information about uh, these uh, Karamanides uh, artifacts. And uh, this proposed system will store and will also uh, help to retrieve all these uh, artifacts and by using uh, control vocabulary. And uh, in terms of users, users are wearing multiple hats. They are not just users. They are also uploading their uh, family archives, their, their personal archives about Karaman Lidika. And in the meantime, they are annotating. They are uh, sharing their information about these pieces and uh, communicating with other users and researchers. And uh, this proposed digital library will also have uh, uh, some guidelines, and, uh, and uh, it's hoped that we'll also uh, house monthly exhibitions that anyone can come uh, visit this digital library and see uh, monthly uploaded Karaman Lidika artifacts, and uh, they, can, uh, they can see them. 
So uh, I just have an example of an uh, entity relationship diagram here. You see the Karamanlitika is the uh, most popular keyword, but in some cases, like in that uh, uh, uploaded uh, Facebook picture, they may use Karamanije, they may use Karamanli, they may use Karamanlilar, but of course we will use this uh, uh, authoritative entry Karamanlidika and Karamanlides uh, for, uh, for these resources. Libraries, uh, archives and museums and other memory institutions uh, were the primary keepers of cultural artifacts before the invention of the World Wide Web, especially uh, Web 2.0. With the emergence of social media, uh, everything's radically changed and enhanced, and the public, they start to disseminate their cultural heritage directly, and therefore they bypass the memory institution. So such a digital library project may be a good uh, uh, venue, uh, uh, environment that they can share all the uh, um, cultural artifacts they have. So uh, it's also hoped that this uh, proposed digital library with the project will be also a cultural glue that creates bonds and cultural knowledge frame for a cohesive Karamanides community in this distributed uh, environment. And it's hoped that this will also facilitate genealogy research among these dispersed people and common understanding of cultural heritage, common stays, and the shared countries such as uh, Cyprus, uh, as we mentioned previously. And uh, it's also hoped that uh, Karamanides uh, will be a good example, this digital library will be a good example to some other uh, communities uh, which is in similar need for uh, creation of a digital library. So uh, we talk about all these uh, cultural artifacts and uh, families and uh, researchers holding these uh, resources in their personal archives. And how about the Karamanlidika monographs? Um, they are also dispersed all over the world and uh, they are housed in a variety of libraries and repositories. And um, I have some example uh, here. Uh, that's uh, one of the Karaman Lidika books. Uh, this is a famous song. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it reads as Yeni Sevdali Sharki on the top. And uh, at the bottom, the, the lyrics of a very famous Turkish song. Uh, probably you heard about Recebim Sharkisi. I was wondering, any of you heard about Recebim Sharkisi? It reads as Gemilerde Talim Var, Talim Var. Bahriyeli yarim var, yarim var. O da gitti sefere, ne talihsiz başım var. Hadi benim Recebim, Recebim. So this is the, uh, the first uh, part of this famous song. So this is uh, from the uh, Yeni Sevdalı şarkı, an example of uh, how uh, Karaman Lidika was uh, in, in those uh, monographs. And um, I have another example of uh, this uh, a special uh, culture here. This is the um, Hakiki Singer. When you read, you see that uh, this is the uh, special documentation of this uh, special uh, sewing machine purchased by uh, a Karamanli Des family. And uh, you see that this is coming from uh, Merkezi Umumi. It's Hakiki Singer. And uh, all the details about this. Uh, uh, particular uh, purchase uh, done by this family. And um, I have another example, the, uh, the, the entrance of this uh, monograph. Uh, on the top you see the Karaman, Karaman Lidika entrance and uh, you see the transliteration at the, at the bottom. And uh, when you read, when you transliterate, so this is something uh, similar we would like to do in the digital library. Uh, whenever we upload a Karaman Lidika document, we would like to see the transliteration so anyone can read and understand the content uh, or description of the artifact. We have Hristiyan Asakiri Osmaniyesine Mahsus Talimi Ahlak Risalesi Musannifi Leonidos Leonidos Allaha Iman Batana Sadakat Padishaha Ubudiyet Kanuna Itaet 
Der Saadet Patrikhane Matbaası 1911. In 2010, I returned to Cyprus for my second Fulbright, and um, my objective then was to bring these two bi-communal societies of the Turkish and the Greek Cypriots closer to each other and understanding each other's language from the library's perspective. Cyprus um, had always, always since 1960s, had a UN presence, as you see in some of these pictures, but the communities lived together until 1974, when there was a division of the island. My work with the librarians from the Cypriot Turkish universities and the Greek Turkish universities that you see in these pictures um, was very um, collaborative, was very trusting, was very engaging until uh, the two communities came together to begin to realize the commonalities of their cultures, their language in some uh, respects, as well as um, their professions, librarianship. Trust was built to the point where we opened each other's special collections to discover in those collections the Garaman Lidiga book that I was seeing for the first time. Some examples of those books are here from their special collections and for me to realize for the first time these two cultures coming together in sounding Turkish Ottoman words with the Greek spelling of the titles and the text of the books. Um, some of the elements of the Garaman Lidiga book is of course the special dots that you see uh, over the Greek letters to indicate the Turkish pronunciation of those words. And of course, Arabic calligraphy, such as the Tura of uh, Sultans, of the Sultans sealed on, on the books. This particular book, it was published in Istanbul, Istanbulat, in uh, I think in 18, 1877 uh, by an Armenian uh, publisher. So we see more than just one culture or identity come together. Uh, there is the Arabic script and the Greek and Turkish pronunciations of, uh, of these books. Now, my colleague will talk a little bit more about how we would like to see these books depicted into our catalogs and our ability to discover them through our systems. So um, some of these monographs are housed in our libraries. We, um, we search world cats and uh, we analyze bibliographic descriptions of uh, some of these Karamanli works or the uh, manifestations of Karamanli Dika. So we found uh, uh, Karamanli Dika uh, surrogate records for Karamanli Dika works in, uh, in, in these libraries. And we examined some of those uh, mark records and would like to share our uh, recommendations. Um, one, of the, one of the university libraries, Boğaziçi University Library from Istanbul, Turkey, where I had my Fulbright research uh, conducted, is a good uh, uh, place for many Karaman Lidaka resources. And uh, this is one of the uh, Karaman Lidaka works that uh, you can see the uh, bibliographic records. And um, in, um, you see the title, this is the Chingane Kızı. And uh, they transliterate the title and uh, they put the, um, as you see, the publishing information. Uh, but the only information in the surrogate records indicates that this is a Karaman Lidika work, is the subject heading 650 field here. It's Turkish language and Karamanlı. And uh, so, um, uh, this is how it describes. So if you're looking for Karaman Lidika in, in World Cats, you will not able to retrieve this uh, bibliographic record, nor you will able to know that Boğaziçi University Library has a, a, a great collection of Karaman Lidika monographs. Another example is from uh, Library of Congress, and uh, this is the uh, uh, this is the newer edition of a Karaman Lidika work, Temasha Dunya ve Cefaker Ucefakesh. It's a 
it's a well-known uh, uh, work. It's first published in Karamanlidika, but then later on, in 1986, uh, they uh, republished, and uh, here you see that uh, there is a title information in notes area. We see that Roman transcription of the original Turkish in Greek script published as Temashaya Dunya Cefaker Cefakesh, Istanbul. So we see the, uh, the date of the original work. But, uh, and look at the subject headings. We see Turkish civilization, 19th century in 651 mark field, but we don't see anything about Karamanlidika or Karamanlides. Usually, when you're looking for uh, Karamanlidika mon monographs, you look for the keyword Karamanlidika. So here again, we don't have any uh, indication of uh, this uh, mostly used keywords in, in the record, nor a subject heading. Another surrogate record is uh, from uh, British Library, and uh, this is also uh, another Karamanlidika work. In 245, we see Hazreti Havramen, Ziyade-i Çok, Cana Menfaatle, Kurban Çekesi. So, uh, so we see that this is also published in uh, Constantinople in 1836, and uh, we have some uh, notes field information. Again, uh, information about the language Karamanlidi Turkish. So this is how they describe in the notes area Karamanlidi Turkish written in Greek letters, Romanized in the normal way, and uh, there is no subject heading. So. Uh, we really don't see that uh, any information about the, uh, the, the genre of, of this particular work either. So uh, our findings that uh, results show that published works representing of the Karaman literature are dispersed all over the world in a variety of libraries and repositories. However, due to lack of subject headings, and Library of Congress call numbers, because some of these resources are classified and housed in uh, Turkish language section, some of them in, in modern Greek language section, and uh, some of them are just waiting to be cataloged. So due to lack of subject headings and Library of Congress call numbers, retrieving these works are very problematic. And there is no specific bibliographic description used for um, any of these Karamanli works. In most of the aforementioned library catalogs, as you saw the surrogate records, they only use the uh, notes area. So our recommendation for our colleagues at Library of Congress, LC subject heading, call number, and, uh, and perhaps uh, the language code, uh, we didn't uh, mention that, but usually they use a TU language code for Turkish for all this uh, Karamanlidika Works in some cases they use the uh, Greek Greek code, so it should be established a new one for uh, Karamanlidika. And uh, if I just summarize by creating a new subject heading for Karamanlidika or Karamanlides, we can uh, organize all these monographs under one subject heading, and uh, we can make all the researchers uh, access uh, much easier to the uh, to the Karamanlidika. Uh, uh, works. And we would like to conclude our presentation with this image and a sound bite um, of a song. Uh, these are Karaman leaders. So you, as you see, they're all gathered together with their instruments, their Turkish flags, and they're singing their Karaman Lee song. If, let me see if I can get to this. So today we spoke of Karaman leaders' people, the culture, their language, and their literature as we have come to experience that from our research. Our Fulbright assignments presented the diversity and the commonalities of these two distinct cultures, and uh, the Turkish and the Greek cultures. And we believe that it's our responsibility to preserve their cultures, their records, and to make them discoverable through standardization of uh, subject headings and descriptors. Thank you. So we'd be happy to have some questions from anybody. Do people have questions? Michael?
That would be great. Thank you very much. Michael, thank you again. Um, can you just t tell us a little bit about the Armenian-Turkish uh, um, literature? I'm not very much well, familiar I mean, with that. I'm not the one who cataloged them, okay. but uh, um, the Armenian cataloger does not know Turkish. So when he gets a book in Armenian script and starts reading it and realizes that it's not uh, Armenian, he, he brings it to us. He usually brings it to Alan. That is, mm -hmm. um, together they uh, figure out um, what it says. But we've also gotten a couple of books in Kurdish in the Armenian script, particularly translations of the Bible. And I often wonder who was intended as the audience of that. I mean, who would only know the Armenian alphabet but speak Kurdish? It's in, in 1875. It's a bit of a mystery to me who was the intended audience for such a thing. And that was my experience too when I was working with the rare book collections in of my Turkish uh, Cypriot libraries, and my colleagues presented me with those books and said, here, you speak Greek, you understand Greek, you could read what is said. And I started reading it, and I was listening to my Turkish pronunciation of Allah, the great God, <laughs> and uh, I did not understand a word I was reading, but they understood everything, of course. <laughs> Yes. But there are, I know of no Kurds who spoke Kurdish but wrote it in the Armenian script. So oh. I think it was more of yes. Yeah. Great. We have any other questions? I met some of the children and grandchildren of uh, Karamanlides in the United States. Yeah. Not Greece or Cyprus or the Balkans. Yes, yeah, some of the um, some of the oral interviews conducted uh, it was in Greece, and um, after the uh, Mubadele, they um, they went to uh, Greece and different places, and some of them they came to the United States. This is mm -hmm. how. Uh, I, uh, I, uh, I think uh, she met some of the grandchildren. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they, they dispersed all over the world. And I'm also a member of this Facebook group. It's called Scattered Greeks, that uh, they talk about their great great parents and their families. And uh, they try to learn more about their uh, transcendental homelands that uh, they 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 never been there but the only image in their head is through their grandma's uh, stories so they talk about these places and they know the villages that they born but they never been to turkey either so just like uh, this uh, this summer we met some of the researchers from australia and new zealand they were planning to come to Turkey to see the land that uh, some of their great parents they mentioned and they talk about the Gallipoli and so uh, I think uh, they're all over the world. I also met some of Australian Greeks that they are uh, looking some information about their family roots in Anatoly. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think they're all over the world. Yes, um, this is just in the preparation stage yet, and, and of course we cannot propose an automated system because it's such a special language and requires a special skill of transliteration. As you all uh, appreciate that you need two experts, just like in the case of uh, Armenian characters and Turkish, you need both knowledge of Armenian letters, knowledge of Ottoman Turkish, not the regular Turkish, because the Turkish they speak right now of currently is also different. They had the language uh, 
revolution. A lot of words have been, uh, been left behind. So you really need someone who can speak the, uh, the, the Turkish of that time that they, they created these works. So you need multiple language expertise. So it is almost impossible to create such an automated system. So uh, the proposed library will have users wearing multiple hats as transliterator and uploading the uh, images of uh, Karamanlidika works and then transliterating by themselves in the system with the help of some other users. So uh, this is the, uh, this is the uh, plan for, uh, for the system and it's still in the process of uh, uh, working. We have any other question? Comments? Well, um, I received a Fulbright to go to country, Turkey, and uh, organize some workshops and uh, meet the specialists and librarians. And at the first stage, we had the proposal of the digital library and the, uh, the uh, uh, architecture of the digital library, but we didn't complete uh, any uh, technical work yet. So, uh, uh, and the Boğaziçi University was a great host and uh, they hosted me and I spent there my Fulbright research and they had two uh, scholars researchers. They helped me to put the web page together just to disseminate the information because you can surprise that there are so many uh, people out there. They never heard of Karamanlidika. They don't know about this uh, hidden uh, gems of uh, uh, literature. I mean, we know about uh, Turkish literature, Ottoman literature, Greek, Armenian, but we don't know about these uh, this, uh, works created in between those different cultures. So uh, it, uh, the first stage was to really disseminate what we're planning to do and, and gather support. So the technical part did not start yet, and the plan is if everything goes well with the university and the stuff, to apply for a grant so we can hire people to, uh, to put the uh, system together so we can start uploading uh, some family archives. Because I'm also a Facebook uh, member of some of these groups that uh, they have huge documentation in their own houses and they don't know how to share. I mean, we all using Facebook, we post a lot of things. It just disappears in Facebook. The, the major problem in Facebook in terms of sharing Retrieve, it's not really retrievable. And if you cannot retrieve what is in there, as you know, the, the, the main objective of a library catalog should be retrievable. So Facebook is not the best place to share those type of resources. So all these people, they really to share what they have at somewhere else in, 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 on a better platform. So hopefully once we have the funding and put the uh, technical uh, system uh, digital library out there, we will have many people uh, supporting the creation of this uh, library. We also came to know a lot of uh, scholars, uh, Greeks and Turks, uh, through a, um, um, a conference that they hosted for the second time, and there's a publication of their essays called Cries and Whispers of Garaman Lidiga. Uh, there were about 50 some scholars who continue to do this kind of work and uh, I think reading their essays in that conference was extremely eye-opening for both of us to realize that there is some true scholarship there that we need to capture uh, the, the history behind it. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.